Hi, I'm Stephen Vattinger, a senior solution engineer at Chocolatey Software. And in this session, we're going to talk about user experience. The talk title is This Sucks, a how-to guide on writing accessible tools. So in this talk, we're going to talk about things from the end user consumer perspective and from the developer perspective as well. So what even is UX? When I say UX, I mean user experience. The two are interchangeable. So you'll, you'll hear me say UX, you'll hear me say user experience throughout the, throughout the talk here. Um, but just know when I say UX, I mean user experience and vice versa. So why does UX even matter? Why should we care, right? A bad user experience will lead to people not using your tools. Um, there's a lot to be said about keeping things simple and easy to use. And you can kind of correlate this to your experience you might have in a restaurant or at a store. Uh, maybe your food takes too long to, to come to you or it's cold or something like that. Or um, a store employee is rude, uh, gives you poor customer service. Um, those things kind of tend to stick with you and make you want to either not go to that restaurant anymore or wait a really long time before you go back or maybe not want to shop at that particular store anymore either. Um, there's a direct correlation there um, when we're writing our code as well. If our code's hard to use or hard to maintain, nobody's going to want to use it and nobody's going to want to help you maintain it either. So that symbolic relationship is, is directly related in real life um, and things like going to a restaurant and, and things like writing your tools. Um, that user experience always matters. Okay, so we know that user experience matters, but how? Thankfully, there's a ton of stuff that you can do in your PowerShell code to make the user experience great, both from the maintainer contributor point of view, developer point of view, and from the end user point of view as well, the, the people that are going to be consuming your, your tools. And at the end of your, the day, your end users are in fact your customers. Um, they don't actually have to be paying you money for a product that they use. Some of you may be doing that and that's fine and that's perfectly valid. But if you're a help desk admin or a sys admin at your company and you just deal with your end users, they are your customers. So at the end of the day, their experience when using your tools matters. From a developer perspective, things like helpful commit messages make a difference. In your commits, be specific. Clearly document that change. A couple of lines in the commit message doesn't make sense. Like, this is terrible and should be yeeted into the sun, but I can't be bothered to fix it right now. That's not the type of commit message that we wanna see. What we wanna see is a clearly documented change this commit fixes this issue by implementing x y z if you're using issues in your github repositories or your gitlab repositories or whatever repository solution you happen to be using if there's an issue tracker and you're associating an issue with your commits put the issue number at the front of your commit message and if you're on github or any of the other platforms typically what that will do is associate that commit with the issue so that when you're in the issues section looking at that particular issue, the commit is tagged onto that. It, it's referenced uh, onto that issue and vice versa. If you look at the commit, there's a hyperlink to the issue uh, right on the commit as well. So that tracking and, and discoverability into the history of the project uh, is very clearly defined and really easy to follow. Another thing that you can do is be verbose in your code. It's one thing when you open up a shell and you need to just get a piece of information either from your local machine or from a remote machine. Sure, you can use an alias to, to keep your command short and just really quickly get your work done. But from a developer perspective, when you're writing your code, you really should avoid using aliases. Those full commandlet names provide a more verbose and easy to follow code path that maybe other developers, maintainers, or people that hop in and read the source uh, for your for your application on GitHub, um, they can more clearly understand what's going on. 
just because I know what an alias means doesn't mean that everybody knows what that alias means. So by avoiding using the aliases, we eliminate that source of confusion for people. I also don't recommend comments for the sake of comments, especially in PowerShell. The PowerShell language is very verbose and pretty clear to understand with the verb noun syntax that the commandlet should follow. So comments for the sake of comments, I don't think are very useful, but if it's very complex logic that you're trying to work something out inside of your code, it's, it's okay to document that in a, in a comment block uh, above that particular section so that another developer or somebody later on down the road that wants to read the source code can come in, read that, that code comment and understand what's going on uh, in that particular block of code and, and more clearly parse um, that block of code. They might not fully understand all the ins and outs of what the code's doing, but at least they know what it's supposed to be doing. Uh, via that code comment. From an end user perspective, there's also a ton of stuff that we can do baked into the PowerShell language. First and foremost, and I think most important, is the help system. PowerShell is very discoverable by default. Things like git help, git command, git module, etc. The Those three pillars of, of getting started with PowerShell, um, the most important of those, I think, is git help. And you can write your help using comment-based help uh, right inside of your functions. And I'll show you in Visual Studio Code how Visual Studio Code can really quickly help you uh, scaffold that out. There's also the concept of online help. Uh, the get help commandlet has the online parameter, which if you've specified a URL for uh, online help inside of your function, the online parameter will open that URL in the default browser of the user. This is helpful to allow the user to get help right in the console as they're using your tool. They can run get help, whatever the command name is, and see examples, details of the parameters, what types it expects, whether they're mandatory or not mandatory, etc. They also can type that online flag in and have that help available to them in a browser where they can have the help out of their way, still have their console available, and be able to read how to use a particular commandlet that they might be attempting to use uh, inside of their code, for example. So from a user experience standpoint, uh, that help is very, very important and very useful. Also, it's good to use approved verbs. PowerShell has a list of approved verbs uh, available to it and you can use the get get verb commandlet if you're not familiar with all of the options available to you there or you need a refresher on your available options private functions it's more okay to not use approved verbs um, and that can really be a, a distinction in the code if somebody sees uh, something that just looks funny maybe it's not verb noun nomenclature or maybe it's not an approved verb uh, for example, they can know that, hey, this is a private function. This is never exposed to the end user. This is something that when a user imports a module, they can't run that particular commandlet directly. It's only available privately inside of the module scope. Another thing that you should do is use sane parameter names. Yeah, it's really good to keep this short and succinct and to the point. But there are edge cases where it just makes sense that the parameter name is going to have to be longer. Parameter validation is also very important. And there are several methods that you can use to validate parameters inside of PowerShell. And we'll look at a couple of those once we get to the examples. But things like validate sets, um, validate scripts, etc., cetera, um, are good ways that you can do that right inside of the parameter block before anything really even executes. Auto-completion is another great way to increase the user experience by providing a set of options that are concrete to the user such that when they use the commandlet that you've given them, they have a list of options for that particular param parameter that they can choose from. And there's a couple of different flavors uh, of using auto-completion inside of PowerShell that we'll touch on and also pipeline support. 
PowerShell was built for the pipeline. It's object oriented. You can generate an object in one commandlet and send it as input to another commandlet. And you can string those things together to create really complex pipelines that get work done very, very quickly. So adding pipeline support to your, to your functions is also very much encouraged. And that's enough slides. I don't particularly like slides, but there was a lot of information to, to cover. So I felt like slides were warranted in this particular case. So for the demo, I'm actually going to pick on a module I've written for the status dashboard server. It's an open source project that allows you to provide a web UI for uh, providing input into uh, different services that you might um, provide to your end users. Uh, it's pretty cool and it's very, very robust and powerful. And I felt like it needed an API PowerShell wrapper. So uh-oh was born and here it is. So if we look inside of the very first function that we're going to take a look at here, um, connect status server and the, really the meat and potatoes, what I want to call out here, uh, inside of this particular function is the comment based help. And all of this was scaffolded out for me by visual studio code. And if I were to just remove it and come in here and hit pound pound, Visual Studio Code is going to put that snippet in there for me. And you can see that it's kind of highlighting on that short description line that allows me to type inside of there. And then I can just tab to the next thing, type some more, tab to the next thing, et cetera, et cetera. So for every parameter that you've defined inside of your commandlet binding in your parameter definition here, VS Code will scaffold out a parameter for it. And then uh, it has uh, just a boilerplate section for an example. You can add more later if you want to, uh, which is actually very much encouraged. There's probably more than one way that you can use your, your function. So I would document as an example each way uh, that you can do those things. But VS Code gives you that for free. Uh, so it's super easy to add your comment-based ba help, and there's really no reason to forget it. And another thing I want to point out in this particular function is the use of the help URI decorator in the commandlet binding here. So I've given it a URL to a, a markdown version of the comment based help here that I host up on the GitHub repository for this project. And this is what lights up the online switch for Git help. So if somebody were to call Git help connect status server dash online, PowerShell is going to read into this function, see this help URL, URL and open that link in, in my default browser, such that the help for the function is out of my way, perhaps in a browser on another screen. And then I have my console open in front of me so that I can read the help while I'm attempting to use the commandlet. Another thing I wanna quickly call out here, uh, just a couple of items actually, is what you see in these parameter blocks. So this parameter block here, where I say this is a parameter decorator and I'm calling mandatory. I, I'm saying that status server, this parameter is mandatory. I have to provide it. And then here I've got nothing. So this is optional, etc. And then I have a credential object as well that's also mandatory. In this status server, I actually have an alias on here as well, such that you can use either host name for this parameter or status server for this parameter. And if I wanted to use more than one alias, I could add those here, it's an array. I'm also strongly typing these parameters to be certain .NET types. So for example, the status server is a string if I were to give it an integer or some other type, it would throw an error because it's not a string. That lets the function or the commandlet fail early and inform the user what went wrong. And again, a switch is a true false. So if I were to give it some arbitrary string accidentally, it would throw an error as well because it's expecting to either be true, meaning that you've passed it, or false, meaning that you haven't passed it. 
and then for a credential I'm strongly typing to a PS credential object so if you don't give me a credential um, the way PowerShell handles this actually when it's mandatory is it will prompt you for a username you type it in you hit enter it prompts you for a password you type it in you hit enter and you get your PS credential object um, but if you were to give it just a string or something like that um, it's going to attempt to use that string as the username and then the password would be wrong and it gets a little bit messy um, but it's strongly typed to be a credential so it's going to treat that string like the username of a credential um, so just something to be aware of um, and something that you can use to, to help your end users know that hey this actually is a username and password so that's all for the connect status uh, server function that I wanted to call out here. Uh, once we step into new status server incident, we're going to see some other uh, information. We're going to see the same comment-based help in this particular function because I've got comment-based help in every uh, function for this module. And then I've also got that helpful uh, help URI as well that points to the online version of that comment-based help. And we'll look at how I generate that markdown file as well uh, once we step through all of this code. But a couple of things to call out in this particular function is my use of a validate set here. So a validate set allows me to provide a certain set of values that I want this particular status parameter to accept. So I say because the API is limited on the back end, it can only accept these items. Anything else will cause the API to fail. I don't want the end user to be able to provide something that will just cause them an error anyways. That's a bad user experience. So I say, you can only provide major outage, operational, degraded performance, partial outage, and maintenance. From an end user perspective, they probably aren't going to know what those values are unless they're an admin of the status server and have access to the full docs, etc., cetera, um, so they understand what those values possibly could be. But I can provide them to the end user via a validate set so that they can start typing major and hit tab and it'll auto-complete, or they can provide status and hit tab, and it'll just give them all the options available, and then they can select the one they want to use, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I'm doing the same exact thing down here with state. Uh, in that the only states that the API will accept are investigating, identified, monitoring, and resolved. And if you give it anything else, it's just going to throw an error anyways. So I give the end user the ability to select the state that I know the API accepts so that they can't fall over on their own. And then the rest of this is just it's an API wrapper, so it's crafting the API call and using invoke rest method to hit the API and, and set this uh, incident up, create that new incident inside of status. The next thing we'll take a look at is the set status service commandlet, or function rather, inside of this module. And again, I'm doing the same comment based help, the same help binding. Um, just calling out that we're going to uh, actually I've got a typo in there set status service on this particular one and then I'm doing something with an argument completer so argument completion can be done a couple of different ways inside of PowerShell the easiest to get started with is what we just saw in this new status incident commandlet where we're using a validate set and we have an array of accepted values. That's probably the simplest way to get started. In newer versions of PowerShell, there's also the register argument completer PowerShell commandlet that you can use to give it uh, a particular function name, the parameter, and then the accepted values for that parameter. And then anytime somebody uses that parameter, it will be um, able to be auto-completed based on what you build out there. And then the third way, and the way I like to do it now that I kind of know uh, about it and how it works, is to use an argument completer, which under the hood 
is what register argument completer is using anyways. It just gives me a little bit more control over the data coming into it. So what this basically means, and I will put a link uh, down here at the bottom of this file. Um, I, do, I don't have a, a link to the blog post handy. Uh, but if you were to Google for VEX32 uh, clear script uh, argument completer in Google, uh, you'll find the blog of Joel Salo, which happens to be a colleague of mine here at Chocolatey Software and the creator of the PS Quants project. He's an awesome guy, and he's got a super great blog post put together on argument pleaders and argument transform attributes, the whole, the whole nine yards, and he goes into great detail and really, really helpfully explains exactly what's going on uh, inside of this uh, class, uh, this, this .NET class that we're using here or this .NET type rather that we're using here and really the important bit to know is this word to complete this is what does the tab completion for us here and in order to get the list of things that are going to be tab completed what I'm doing is I'm calling another function inside of this module called get status service and I'm grabbing all of the permalinks from the returned object of get status service. And those are basically the little slugs at the end of the status URL for each service um, that you have configured inside of status. So uh, those names, they, they can be a little unintuitive because they might have dashes in them, etc. So it, it could be relatively easy to get those wrong. So what I like to do is grab all of them from the get status service commandlet and save them to a variable and then what I do is if I've started typing something in that parameter that becomes words to complete so if I have a couple of services called like apple and banana and carrot and maybe dog um, if I were to start typing a and hit tab apple would auto complete or b for banana or c for cat etc uh, etc et um, that's what results dot where I'm doing a regex match starting at the beginning of the word, which is what this caret here means, and then whatever I've started typing. So if I if I have a really long list, and I want to start at like the F's or the D's, I can just start typing D tab, and it'll start me at the D's, or G tab, and it'll start me at the G's, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, until I get all the way through the list. Or if I don't type anything and I hit tab, just like a validate set, it will give me all the results that are available. And then I can see what's there and start typing in tab or um, in newer versions of PowerShell with PS Readline, I can select the one I want and, and tab it in right from there. So that's what I'm doing with an argument completer in this example. There are ways, and off the top of my head, I think it's fake bound params, where you can take the value of a previous parameter. So if I had something defined before up here, and we'll just call it a string, and maybe it's foo. So if I were to use foo in here, that would become fake bound params. And then I could autocomplete based on the value of foo basically. So you can get even more advanced um, with an argument completer as well. But by default, and what I like to do uh, with argument completers, I just use the, the word to complete portion of it. Um, but again, if you go to uh, Google and just type in vex32 clear script argument completer, uh, he lays out uh, what, you, what each of these means. And you can also just Google PowerShell argument completer C sharp and, and read the actual C sharp documentation for the argument completer uh, .NET type if you want more information. And then I mix and match. I, I have a complex one here because I don't necessarily know the names of the services that are going to be returned. So I, that's why I'm using this here. And then I know that the statuses that the API accepts are one of these five options here. So I'm using a validate set for that. 
and you can do other things for parameter validation as well. Uh, if I were to define a parameter and let's call it a string and let's call it a file and I want to validate that file actually what they gave me actually exists that they didn't make a typo in what they gave me or something like that I can use a validate script parameter decorator for that so if I were to do this this is just a script block inside of here so validate script parentheses inside of your script block you can do something like test path whatever the actual item is whatever file is and if you wanted to use the other syntax ps item if that's a little easier for you to read um, ps item is the same thing as dollar under bar and what this will do is either give you a true false so if it's true that file actually does exist everything's hunky dory it moves on uh, if that file doesn't exist, say you wanted to send it a CSV file and you sent it a CVS file instead because you made a typo. Happens to me all the time. If the parameter had a validate script on it and I was validating that it actually gave me the correct file type, for example, um, then yes, that, that would throw an error and it would let me know that, hey, that file doesn't exist, etc. Um, and you can use other things like uh, system.io. get file path and the extension name and all that good stuff and validate the the extension passed in is the right extension and that will change uh, the type of error that is thrown back at the user as well. So you can do custom errors inside of your of your parameters, which is super handy. And another thing to really do is is really think about your code and how PowerShell executes things. So begin blocks run at the start before anything from the pipeline is processed. And the process block is ran once for everything that's in, in the pipeline. So if you've got eight objects from a previous commandlet that you've piped into another commandlet, the process block is going to run once for every of those eight, for every one of those eight items. Whereas setting up that commandlet to run the, the begin block is going to run once the very first time something is passed in. And then after the process block is the end block. Um, so after everything is, has been uh, consumed and processed in the process block, the end block is going to run and things will get cleaned up. So the begin block is another great place uh, to do any kind of validation. Uh, that you need to do on stuff uh, as, as well. So I talked briefly about the, the developer expectations for user experience, and I've talked briefly about the end user expectations for user experience, and I've kind of shown you the end user uh, user experience things uh, as we walk through this uh, module. So the next thing I want to do is really spend a couple of minutes and talk about those developer type things. And let me find my terminal window. There it is. So I'm already in the directory with this uh, uh, module uh, source code. We can come in here. We can see uh, that I've got my output folder, Poshbot, all, all the all the source for, for this particular module is inside of here. And I'm going to do uh, a git branch, or rather a git checkout. And I'm just going to check out a new, a new demo branch here. Great, awesome. So I'm going to make a change inside of this code. Um, set status service. I'm going to come down here and remove this line here and stop clicking too many buttons. And maybe I want to add something in. Maybe I actually want to save this so that this file thing uh, is actually part of this code. And then I want to close, close these other two files. Perfect. And then I want to revert a 
couple of other changes that I that I made as well. Give me a nice clean slate so that when I do get get status inside of here, we can see that I've I've made that that change to set status service. I've added that file parameter in with that validate script uh, inside of there. And now I want to commit this code to this new demo branch that I've just created. So I'm going to do a git add source public uh, set status service. And now that I've added that file and I do another git status, I can see that it's it's ready to be committed. It's staged for commit. So I'll clear my screen and I'll do git commit and I'll type m for message. And now I'm going to actually type my commit message and we're going to pretend that I've created issue number 127 to document that um, there there's something new uh, with with this commandlet, um, the 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 service now accepts a file uh, as as part of its its status. Maybe a log or something like that can be consumed um, by the end user when they when they look at the the status of that particular service on the on the web UI or something along those lines. We needed to add file, so I'm going to say add file parameter to set status service but I'm not done that that's going to be like the the part of the commit message that is uh, by default displayed inside of github um, and then there's going to be three ellipses at the end of the commit message where you can have uh, more information and inside of that more information section I'm going to more clearly document why I've made this made this change so I'm going to say starting in version 3.2.1 of status, it is now possible to upload a log file and attach to a, a log file to a service incident, which can be consumed consumed via the web UI and I'll close that off and I'll hit enter so that's now been committed I'm not going to actually push this branch up or anything because I'm not going to actually use it for anything but if I were to commit this um, up to, to github if I were to push this up to github uh, when I were to go and actually let's just do it let's just show it Git push you origin demo. Beautiful. Let's just go get out of here. And let's go to that demo branch. So now I've got 54 commits. I can see that I've added that file parameter to set state of service. And if I click on this commit, I now have more information in the commit message that I can clearly see why I made this change. And if 127 happened to be an issue, this would be a hyperlink that would take me to that particular issue. And then in the issue, if there was a, an open issue for 127, that commit would be referenced in the issue so that it's clearly documented all the way through the code path from uh, the issue clear to the commit to the pull request etc all of that is referenced so that i as a developer have a very clear picture of what happened when and why the change was made and then as somebody who uses this particular module um, comes in, wants to read the source code, etc. They can go to a commit and see why that commit was made and go to an issue and see, um, well, this was an issue, it's been fixed. Here's how they fixed it. Or this is an issue that's still open, but there's commits, they're working on it. 
so we understand exactly what's going on and we can kind of get a, a really good feel for um, everything that's going on inside of the project. Um, and while I'm in GitHub here, uh, one thing that I could show off is the fact that uh, when you create a new issue, instead of going directly to this window and, and having a title and a message, uh, you can set up issue templates. So things like a feature request or a bug report, uh, etc. cetera. Um, you can have templates for those things. So when they create a new issue or click on new issue, they're asked what kind of issue they are creating. If they click bug report, they can have, you can have boilerplate in here for the title that they replace with a, with a title. So you can kind of clearly define what you want the format of the title to be. And then you can maybe have like, uh, what are you seeing? Uh, things like uh, expected output and maybe log output, something like that. Clearly defined sections that, that let the end user know that you need this information such that when they file the issue, you don't have to go read it and then ask them for information and then wait for them to respond to the issue, which they may or may not do. Um, so giving them a, a very clear idea of what's expected of them and, and all of the information up front allows them to file a really good issue for you. You have everything you need to get started on a bug fix or implementing that feature. And then they know that you have everything you need um, to get started and it just shortens that gap of, of, of time that basically is going to be uh, required to either fix or implement that, the particular thing that the issue is referencing. Let me go back to uh, this while we're in here. And I had mentioned in my code in this help URI that I was generating this stuff uh, on the fly. So my, my build pipeline actually builds my my markdown for me. And I'm utilizing a module, uh, a PowerShell module called Plat APS. So if you haven't heard of it, uh, install module Plat APS. Uh, install that and that what that does is looks at the comment based help inside of your your functions inside of your module and generates markdown based on those. So if we were to uh, get rid of this, because I've already got it installed, um, but if we were to, let's go uh, back here and just do uh, make dir summit cd summit and utilize that module real quick. Let's uh, do import module, uh-oh. And then let's say new markdown help module, uh-oh, output folder. And I want to use the current folder or, or dot in, in this example. I'm just going to run it. Um, oh, yeah, that's because I'm not running it in the context of, of the module. So I can kind of ignore parts of this because it's not going to find the Poshbot stuff. Um, but that's fine. You can see if we were to clear the screen and do an ls, um, there's all of my markdown files. And if I were to do um, code, sir, actually, let's do connect status server dot md. Let's just open that up. Here is the markdown for that particular uh, connect status server. Uh, PowerShell function. So we we brought across our synopsis, we brought across our syntax, our description, all of our examples. We've laid out all the different parameters and in YAML syntax, so it, it's highlighted different on the website as compared to uh, actual code blocks. Um, we've defined that it's a string type, it's required, it's in the first position, it doesn't have a default value, 
um, accepts pipeline, et cetera, et cetera. All of that stuff is clearly clearly documented in the, the markdown file and will be the same experience whether you're reading it online or whether you're you're reading it in the con in the console. And I didn't really do anything. Like I got all of that for free. When I developed the module, I knew the URLs, uh, the 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 format of the URL uh, that was going to be in use. So I was able to do the help URIs as I wrote the thing. And then when Plat APS generated the markdown and my pipeline pushed the documentation to the right place. I, I knew that every time I updated my module, my help would be updated online as well. So it's really cool. And from an end user experience perspective, that's great because I've given them both in console help and online help. And I really didn't have to do all that much. Uh, Visual Studio Code gave me the plumbing for the comment based help for free just by, again, hitting two pounds and, and you're done. It scaffolds it out and then you can just tab complete through things. And then using the Plat APS module, um, it just generates my my markdown help for me. Super, super useful. Super, super great. And let's go back to this guy. And I'll just start from here. So that's all I wanted to talk about. Um, those are those are the important things to me. Uh, when when I think about user experience, I hope you've been able to glean some information from this. Uh, I hope you've found some of it useful. Uh, if you have any questions at all, uh, I know this is a virtual event. Uh, there's no room or anything for us to chat uh, while I'm doing this. So please reach out to me on uh, either GitHub or Twitter. My my username on both of those is at Stevie Coaster. I've got a blog at uh, steviecoaster.dev. My contact info is also available on side of there. Um, so check that out if you want to. Um, I don't blog as, as often as I should, and most of it is chocolatey and PowerShell Universal related anyways. But if any of that is interesting to you, uh, I do have a blog available out there. And again, if you have any questions about any of this stuff or you want to dive deeper into anything that you've seen in my talk here, please, please reach out to me on Twitter. Um, I'd be more than happy to have a sit-down conversation with you, um, even jump on Zoom or something like that to really dive in so that I can help uh, scoe you up in, in whatever you want. Um, more information on. So again, my name's Steven. Thank you so, so much for checking out this talk. I hope you have a wonderful rest of Summit, and I look forward to seeing you again in person next year for 2022. Take care.